152 years ago today, the Rebbe Rashad was born in Lubavitch to his father, the Rebbe Maharaj, and to his grandfather, the Rebbe Tzemach Tzedek. Five years later, when the Rebbe Maharaj was five years old, he became a husband. A husband? Five years old? Yes, his grandfather, the Tzemach Tzedek, he knew him and he knew his cousin, who was the Rebbe Tzestel she lived far away in Ukraine, but she came always to her grandfather. So he knew his grandchild, the Rebbe, Mar the Rebbe Rasha, and he knew his granddaughter, the Rebbe Tzestel and he felt that for their character and for their holiness, they would do a great match and for in a later date. That means that in the age of five years old, they got married? No. In that day, when the Rebbe Tzmach Tzedek made the shidduch between the two little children, in pre one eight. He wrote Noim for them. He didn't write the whole page. He wrote the first line of his blessing. And then he gave to a scribe to write the whole Noim, where it says that for next 10 years, the father of the Hosn and the father of the Kale are going to deposit some money in the account for their getting married 10 years later when they will be 15. It was common then in that period for people to get married at age 15. So he wrote that for 10 years they'll prepare, deposit some money every year he wrote how much each one will deposit. And then in the end of the Noim, he wrote that I, as grandfather of both, am also going to deposit every year so much money into the account that 10 years later they will be getting married. Yes, that was a good wish. That was, Tzimach Tzadik was then very old. That was a half a year before the stalkers of the Rebbe Tzimach Tzadik. He didn't succeed to deposit every year, only the first time, because a half a year later, were the stalkers of the Rebbe Tzimach Tzadik, of the grandfather of the Hosnik and of the Kalat. But they continued the preparations, and ten years later, when the Rebbe of Rashab and the Rebbe Tzachtanesor was 15, they got married. Where did he get married? In Lubavitch? So let's see what they wrote, what the Tzemach Tzedek wrote in the Noim. He knew them that you could never know what's going to be 10 years from now. Where is going to be the ability to make a Hasana? So what did he write in the Tnoim? Well, he wrote in the Tnoim that 10 years from now, they're going to get married in Yerushalayim. Planning to go to Yerushalayim to make the Hasana? Eh, in those days, going to Yerushalayim was like now going to the moon. It wasn't a plan. It was just to express the fact that we don't know now what's going to be 10 years from now, where it's going to be the proper place. So the Lord Yerushalayim. 
actually, 10 years later, when they had to make the chasana, where did they do it? Oh, it became a big dispute. The Rebbe Marash, the father of the Rebbe Rashab, said, obviously, not Yerushalayim, has to be Lubavitch. That's the center for Chavid Lubavitch Chassidus, and that's where the middle Rebbe was, and the Tzemach Tzedek was, and, the, and, 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 and we are now here, so here it should be. Said the father of the Caliph, who was a Rebbe in the city of Avruch, somewhere far in Ukraine, says, no, we have a minhag that when there is a chosnut and a kale, the chasana should be in the kale's place. Now it's also like that, the custom. So it should be in a vuch. Well, it was a big dispute. Finally, the chasana was in a vuch, in the place of the kale. But it was too far, and the Rebbe Maharaj himself, the father of the chosnut, didn't go to the chasana. He just sent his wife, Rabbi Tzarifke, the mother of the Rebbe Rashad. He sent his Gabe. And they went there. It was then a week or two weeks travel on the horse and wagon. Long way to go. And they get married and they came back. Obviously, he was still 15 years old. Boy, he continued to sit on lab for many years. But he lived in a little house in Lubavitch, near his father. That's how it was for the next seven eight years. Eight years later, when the Rebbe Hashem was only 21 years old, he didn't even become 22. The Rebbe Marash got sick. And it was his talk with the Rebbe Marash. Hasidim turned to the Rebbe Rashab. He should become Rebbe. He said, no. I'm not ready for that yet. To become a Rebbe of Hasidim, of Lubavitch, in all Russia? I'm still too young. I still have to sit to learn. So he continued to learn for another 10 years, he didn't want to become a rabbi. So that means he continued learning in yeshiva, and he didn't, he wasn't rabbi, so he didn't say my morning. No, he said my morning. He didn't write my morning? Yes, he wrote my morning. Yeah, we have today in the Sefer Maimorim of the Rebbe Marat Rashab. We'll take a look, we'll see a Sefer, a whole volume of Maimorim of Tofrish, Mem Gimel, Mem Dalad, Mem Hei, Mem Vov, and Tofrish Nun, and Nun Aleph, and Nun Beis, big volumes for every year. But to become involved in leadership of Chabad, he did do was a He sat and learned declared sins. Well, even today, Bochum are hazarding by Mori. Well, they just hazarding a line from the previous Rebbe. But he, he wrote my Mori of himself. But that was just the way he learned to see this. He learned Nigla. We have Chuvas that he wrote in, the, in those years. But not as a Rebbe. We have letters that he wrote to many Chassidim about different problems, but it was just like a mashpia. He didn't agree to become rabbi till 10 years later. In the end of Tofresh Nun Gim, almost 11 years after the Stalkers of the Rebbe Marash, when the Rebbe Rashabo was already then 33 years old, finally, he agreed to the request of Hasidim, and he assumed the leadership of Chabad and became officially the Rebbe. First thing he did when he became Rebbe, he decided we have to establish a yeshiva, 
Come to Shiva, what was till then? Bachim didn't allow? Sure, Bachim allowed. But it wasn't the Shiva. It was every Bachim goes in the shul that where he lives, and he sits in shul, and he learns the whole day, and there is usually some people there that know how to learn, and then they sit there and they answer the questions, and sometimes they give a share. They didn't need a teacher to become a police, to control them. They obviously was natural, every bocher sits in shul and learns, and he has shurim from whoever says shurim. He didn't need anyone to control him, to encourage him, to force him to stay in class. Yes, in Lubavitch also there was some kind of yeshiva. What was it? It wasn't called a yeshiva. What was it in Lubavitch? It was called yoishvim. In Yiddish, they would say zitzas. What is zitzas? It was like that then, in those days. Every bocher, when he gets, his bar mitzvah learns a cheder with the malamed, then he stays in shul and he learns the whole day, and then there is a, a, a Rosh Hashiva who gives you him, till he becomes a chosn and he goes to get married. He becomes a chosn and gets married, and he didn't really get the taste, the atmosphere, of a real chassid. So what would he do for one year after he got married or, well, or when he became a chassid? He would go to Lubavitch. There the main chassidim would come always and the rebbe was there. So they would sit there for a year and learn chassidus and hear from the chassidim about chassidus. So then they would get the real taste of becoming a real so that was called Yeshim. Yeshim is like a yeshiva, you see. But it's not like a yeshiva. There was no dormitory and no classes and no nothing. But he would pay someone to in Lubavitch to stay at his house for a year. And during the day he would go to the shul of the Rebbe. And then Chsidim, old Chsidim would come and he would have hear from them stories and fabrengans and, and they would explain him some Chsidas and he would hear the memorium of the Rebbe and he would hear Chazore. So this year would make him really not only a Bochem but a Chsidah sharing him up. The Rebbe Rashab decided this is not enough anymore. Assume today that would be the condition. That whoever wants to learn, let him go to shul and sit there a whole day and learn. How many of boys in your age would just go to the shiva and sit there and learn a whole day? If they don't have a class. It became the world became different. There was a lot of reasons for that. In those years, there was a lot of pogroms. They killed all, in every city. They killed a lot of Jews. Many Jews escaped Russia and they went to Israel or to the United States. A million of Jews during those few years left Russia. So obviously those that stayed, the community became not as strong as before. So, just relying on the fact that every bocha that wants to learn would sit a whole day in yeshiva, in shul, and learn by himself, it wasn't enough. He felt he has to build a yeshiva. Well, to build a yeshiva is not such an easy thing. Well, obviously, he will be the, in the head of the yeshiva, he'll make the decisions. But you need a director, a principal, a mashpia, you need somebody to run the yeshiva. So he still didn't know exactly how this should be done. It took him another few years. He became rabbi at Rosh Hashanah, at the end of Tafrishnan Gimel. 
four years later, the Friedrich Rebbe, the son of the Rebbe Rashad, got married to Mulvavich. I'm with Gimel Elman, professional Zion. Just four years after the Rebbe Rashad became a Rebbe. And they had a discussion among them. What would this new husband, Friedrich Rebbe, do after he gets married? And they discussed the plan of opening a issue. And then they discussed, the Friedrich Rebbe told to the Rebbe Rashad, you know what? You want to open a yeshiva for so long, and you can't handle it by yourself. I'll handle it. You'll be on top of me. You'll give me the orders. You'll give me the directions. You'll you rule every little thing, and I'll be your Follow your orders, and I'll try to do everything to the yeshiva. In the Sheva Brochas of the Friedrich Rebbe, High Elut of Rational Zion, the yeshiva was established. In Babich? No, not exactly. They felt the yeshiva for a yeshiva needs a little space where they are by themselves, not in such a big who how works it in common go. So he selected a city where they will go there and learn. And in Lubavitch stayed a little school of what was called the Yeshvim, as we discussed before. People would come there and learn a little bit and then go away. It wasn't really a shiva, it was a dormitory. That's how it was for one year. But then, kids from all, the Rus all around Russia decided they want to be part of this shiva. That's their future. They don't see really a future in staying in shuls in every little city and village and just wait for somebody to come, give them a shiro and the answer them what's pshat in Tesfes or what's pshat in the Maimer. They have to go to the yeshiva, to the dormitory. Wasn't enough place there in this little yeshiva for all of them. So finally, the Rebbe Rashab took off to the yeshiva to the village. And it grew and it grew. And then they added even a header for children from age of 11 and on came to learn in Lubavitch in the yeshiva. So they learned that from 11 until they get married, no. They learned in the header in Lubavitch, that was the schedule then. They learned in the header in Lubavitch from 11 till after Bar Mitzvah of 14. And then they would go to a other city. The Rebbe opened their branches for what is called Mechine. Between Cheder and between the Yeshiva, they have to be in a place, in a, in a closed place, a closed atmosphere with the Mashpia, and to get really the basics of Chesidus, and learn them for two years, and then they come back to the Babich, to the Yeshiva Dale, to the South, on the age of 16 or so, where they would start the whole day. And that's how it was for the next 20 years. A lot of branches in a lot of cities, mainly for the age between Bar Mitzvah and 16, which is called Mechina. The main place was Shadrin, was in Babinovich and Neville and many other cities. And then, after they become 16 or so, they come to learn of Yeshiva. And this book was really the essence, the base for the Hasidic generation, the next Hasidic generation. 20 years. What happened after? One years later, started the First World War, where the Germans came to fight Russia. 
they took over part of Russia. Russia fought back, and the situation became worse and worse. Till the war came close to Lubavitch, and the rebel with the whole family had to flee Lubavitch. He fled Lubavitch to Rostov, who was the other end of Russia. Today, with the fast train, it was an hour's drive. Then it was several weeks to go. He couldn't take everything with himself. Obviously, he couldn't take his whole library. It was the whole Russia was full with wars. How could it pass with so many items? He put the whole library, packaged them in 20, 35 large crates, and he put them in storage in Moscow. And he himself took with himself a little bit, a few boxes with his phone that he would need, and he went till the stop. The Yeshiva stayed still a little bit in Lubavitch till they couldn't, and they had to move them to Kremenchuk, which is also far away in Ukraine. And then everything started again. Not only because there was then a hunger and wars, the Bochum had to flee Lubavitch. And not only had to flee Lubavitch, but then there was a war. So the government gave a, a decree that every young fellow has to go to the army. Usually they took to the army only part of the nation of the youth. And it was relatively easy to get out of it. Each one looked for ways how to get how to avoid going to the army. You know, Sidi Shabbat would go to the Russian army, nothing would stay with him. They would tell him nothing. They would force him to eat not kosher and the, the work on Shabbos and get dressed like a goy and, and nothing. So every Bohem did everything he could to get a tool to avoid army. But now when the war came, the government didn't care about anything. Everyone goes to army. Because there is a, a war going on against us. The Rebbe Rashab got involved in that. And he felt he must do something to save. And it wasn't only the Bochrim. Even those that already got married and they became rabbis of cities, many of the Talmudim of Lubavitch, of Timrat Mimi, was, was rabbis, young rabbis in cities. They're all forced to go to the army. The Rebbe Rashab went then several times to Petersburg and he spoke to government officials and he spoke to Gvirim to speak to government officials to get a special release for rabbis and for Shoftim from going to the army, explaining that we can't live without them. We need a rov, otherwise they can't live. They need a sheikh, and otherwise they don't starve to death. And finally he got permission. And a few months later, they gave conditions to the to the to the to this rule, and he had to go again, and for two years he was completely involved in his army. In fact, it became worse and worse. Two years later, after the First World War, World War ended, started the Civil War in Russia between the Reds which are called the communists, who actually won there, and between the white and the green, the Denikins and all the other groups. 
And when there was a civil war in the whole country, became so many machlas and people died in the street and there was a hunger. And finally, the Rebbe Hashem himself fell sick. And there was a stomach of the Rebbe Hashem. On the base list of each paper, he was young, he wasn't even 60, he was 59, and he did so much that he, that this situation broke him, all his body, his He became sick, and he knew his hours are number. He called him to his Yechidus room, where he was. He called him in, the Friedrich Yerebe, his son, to the bedroom, and he says, take me into the Yechidus room. I want my last hour should be there. And then he told him, I'm going to the sky. I'm leaving with you everything I wrote. All those years that the Rebbe Rashab was in Lubavitch and leading the yeshiva, he started being together with the yeshiva by also saying my morim every week, explaining the basics of Siddhas. It wasn't just a mime, he said on Shabbos. He would say the Shabbos, the Mimer on Friday night, and then there was the Bochim Chazar, the Mimer between themselves, and then every week the best Bochim that knew better the Mimer, they would go into Yechides and to Chazar in front of the Rebbe summarize what they understood from the Mimer. And then whenever they didn't understand, they had the opportunity to ask the Rebbe what was shot in the mind of, and the Rebbe would explain that. Just like you know in a class that the, the teacher the Rebbe, gives a shear and you understand most of it, but not really everything, and the next day he says, I want to hear from you what you understood, and if you don't understand something, don't be shy and ask, and I will explain it. And that's what he did every week with the Bach. So a few hours before passing, before the Istalkes, he says, And then he wrote a Tzadvoye to the Friedrich Rebbe, saying that I trust you that this Yeshiva that will go up which is the main base for Sidus and Yiddish Katerashi. Don't give up, don't give it up, build it up. Make sure I trust you that it will be rolled up. And that's what the Rebbe did. Obviously we know that in that year the Civil war became stronger and stronger until the communists took over and the communists didn't permit any yeshivas to stay and they closed down all the yeshivas and every malamed that taught his Talmudim, they would arrest him and send him to exile and everything had to go underground. And all the yeshivas in the whole Russia, hundreds of them, closed down. The only yeshiva that stayed was an underground yeshiva of Tenkat Nimi. Here and there, they had split it up to many cities. Every place should be only something like 10 bottles, not more, just for hiding and trying to make sure they will be caught. This mysterious nefesh of staying in the yeshiva, this is what they have learned. In their time, they learned in Yeshiva of the Mimim. The Messias Nefesh they learned, the Chesidus they learned, and out of all 
yeshivas. The only one that was sacrificing and stayed underground was that table. Yes, there was other for him also that wanted to stay and learn underground. The only one, the only way for them to be able to stay in Yeshiva was to go to Lubavitcher Yeshiva, and that's when they became Lubavitchers. My father was one of them. He wasn't from a Lubavitcher house. He was in a city that everything freaked out. They didn't have any more Yeshivas and Hadorim, they would if they found something, they would arrest him right away. He wanted to stay a Jew and to go to yeshiva. You know, the only yeshiva was underground yeshiva in Vitebsk of Temchat Mimi. So he went there. That's how he became a Lubavitcher. And that's how his son is a Lubavitcher standing in front of you. And that's how his son's son is staying every day in front of you as a Lubavitcher. Because then in Temchat Mimi, that's where they learned the real Messias Nefesh. Then Messias Nefesh was to stay in an underground yeshiva. Today, the Messias Nefesh that the Rebbe is demanding from us is that when we grow up, we shouldn't think so much about going to business and become rich. We should go to Shlichas and make sure another one is also getting knowledge about Yiddishkeit. And we have thousands and thousands of Ningalites that go away to live in a place where there is no one that they know, no Chsidish Ningalite, no Fube Ningalite, no kosher food easy, no mikve easy, no shul easy. And they go for the Messias Nefesh only was because they learned in Timrit Mimim that their life is for Messias Nefesh. This is the yeshiva that the Rebbe Nishmu Satan was meyased then, and this yeshiva that I'm standing in now is the continuation of this yeshiva that teaches us not only to be made nefesh ourselves and open the Gemara and look into the Gemara what the Gemara says, but the Messias Nefesh that we, we should know that we have to know the Gemara because this will bring us up later to become like the Rebbe wants us to be. Like the Rebbe wants us not only to know the Gemara for ourselves and the Chesidus for ourselves, but also to teach others. And also in a difficult situation when we have to go a to a far place, uh, we will stay there as the Rebbe wants us to be and that's how it will be, that the Rebbe will see us, he will say, like he mentioned so many times, the Here you could see, when you see the results of this young light that go to a far place, and with Messias Nefesh they stay with the Yiddishkeit, and they stay with the children in Yiddishkeit, and they teach others Yiddishkeit, even though the children don't see too many Yiddish all this is this is what they learned when they was in yeshiva that's what you purpose of your staying in yeshiva here is now not only to understand the taste not only to understand the minor but to build up yourself in a way that you should be able to fulfill the, the wish of the rabbi he should be able to tell us this is just a summary of the history of the Rebbe Rashad of today's birthday and of what he has done in his life. I am sure that some of you heard everything I discussed and wanted to ask some details they didn't really understand on this subject or other subjects and for the rules of the school probably they didn't ask anything so if you have any questions I'll be more than happy to try to answer you. Yes. What's your name? Hi sir. Yes. Uh, your father was my student some 22 years ago in Russia so I'm glad to hear that 22 years later 
you are the, the student of my son. Go ahead. Um, if the author of a contradicts himself in the Siddur and in the Shulchan which according to according to, and how is that even possible? It is the outer Rebbe wrote first his Shulchan Then, some 20 years later, he decided to write, in addition to the regular Shulchan two other things. One was some special collections of alochas like Hilchas Talmutera, Hilchas Birkes Anani, Seda Birkes Anani, Hilchas Tfilm, and in a special general summarizing the alochas. And the second thing was to do write to write a siddur for people to be able to daven in Lubavitch and Nusach, and also all halachas that are related to shul and davening. So that was 20 years later. There are in general two differences between writing the Shulchan 20 years earlier and between writing the Siddur 20 years later. First is, 20 years later, as he explained himself, when I wrote the Shulchan I really didn't have the strength to build on my own understanding. And if I see that the Morgan of Rome and other Reforshim are basketing one way, I followed them. But over the 20 years, I saw some places that I think it's not like their Moscone. That's what he wrote in introduction to say the Birke Sanen. If you take a look in the Siddha, is printed the say the Birke Sananin, there is a three-line introduction to that. Where he writes that in addition to what I once did just to collect from all this forum the Sokim in Aloha Birke Sananin, I hear built on what I understood from the Gemara and the Rishenim, sometimes different of my first understanding 20 years earlier. And here I will pass like my understanding, even though if I uh, have proof that it's not like the Taz Paschal or the Morganagron Paschal. That's what it says in short in these three lines introduction. That's one reason why there are some differences. And obviously, we pass it like the Siddur because this is 20 years later where he writes, that's my final decision. Then comes another thing, that in the Siddur he speaks already to Siddim, that they are ready to be more machmer. Sometimes there is a machleke, so when there is a machleke, you could rely on one day or the other day. If you take a look at the Siddur in Shabbos, there is Seder Agnosis Shabbos, and then Hilchas erupts on the Shabbat, where he writes that even though that al pi halocha you could rely on one day, but there is still another day, and you should be machmer for that day. Because after all, it's a sofek, maybe you'll be ever on, on, on the issue. Just like one of the examples. You are allowed to eat nuts and shabbos. But it's a little complicated. You have to do it the proper way. Why? Because when you knock, you break the nuts. They are mixed with the shells. And if you take the, the, the pieces that you want to eat and you eat, that's okay. But if you take the shells and you put them away, that's better. So it's hard to watch. And also those shells are mukze after they broke. So you're not allowed to touch them. You have to take them off the table from the side of your hand. It's difficult. So therefore, says the Alter Rebbe, I advise we shall refrain, refrain from eating uh, nuts and shabbos. We don't. 
this is not the halacha that says in Shulchan Aruch. That way he is writing to the Chassidim, we should try harder. So that's another example of the second thing, even though that are, that you are allowed to, but still we should have extra efforts since we are Chassidim to do, not to do things, even though if they are allowed to be done. What you Well, it's a Machzedek was then, as I mentioned, a half a year before the Estalgus. And he wanted to make sure he knew this boy. Because when a boy is five years old, sometimes you could really recognize him. And he knew this girl. And as we see later, how this Rabbi Rashab and this Rabbi Zashtar was, he realized that I'm them. And he wanted to make sure, I will make sure that they become a couple It's not usual. It's very out of ordinary. But he felt he wanted to make it. So he made it in the end of Tov Reish of Hay. A half a year later, when they start his condition. Davening, most of davening is praising Hashem and saying how great He is. But Hashem is way beyond the description of a person and the words He could put Him. So isn't it belittling Him, So, two things. First of all, you gave an introduction, most of it is praising. As we know that in Shmonesu we have 18 or 19 blessings. Says the Gemara and the Shulchano, the first three and the last three are praising. And the middle 12 or 13 are asking for Makoshas from Hashem. Therefore, Einu Hashem is not the praise. Borech Aleinu is not the praise. It's a question that we ask from Hashem. But usually when you come to a king and you tell him, hey king, give me this and give me that. It's not proper. So you have to start how great you are. And then please give me, and then I really admire you. So you start with the praise, and you end with praise, and your questions come in the middle. That's for your first sentence that you said. Now the Chachovim say that if you start praising, you could say a million of things, and you'll never end, and you'll still not say nothing. So therefore, the Chachovim say that when you say the Boruch HaTo Hashem, the first Boruch of Shemunesre, say only those words that it says that. Why? Because this is what the Chachovim decided to say. If you say one more word, you make it worse. Why do you make it worse? Because you want to say, and Hashem is this and that. If you start saying, say everything, and you can't say everything. So therefore, we say only what we were told to say, and that's where it starts. So therefore, there is not a problem of how could we praise, because we could never finish praising. We praise only those things that Anshik Nessus Agdelo organized in the first Boche, or in the last three Boches, what we should say, and not more. Yeah. I have a question that will lead to another question. Uncle lived before the lived about the time of the Chulun Besamimus. He was a girl. He was a nephew of the king that destroyed Israel. And he sent him with a group of making sure Israel is destroyed. But when he came there and he saw what the Jews are, he decided that he stays there and became a girl. When the king found out about that, he sent emissaries to force him back. They came there, they took him, and there is a whole story that Gemara said what it was. The final group that he said, he said, okay, I, he told them, 
if you speak to him, he'll make you become a gap. So don't speak to him, just grab him and go. So that's what they did. So he said, okay, I'm going. They left the door, he kissed the mezuzah. So they tell him, what are you doing? So he says, you see, the difference between us and others, in other countries, the whole nation is saving the king. By us, the king is saving us. So this mezuzah on the door saves us in the house. And they got more into it, and they also stayed. So the king didn't know anything else that he could say, because whoever he sends to them becomes a girl. So that's how we became a girl, and that's how we wrote the Tamil What's the reason? Uh, who started Shlaimek? What's the reason? the reason that we have to learn. And the time for learning is mainly on Shabbos. It started, it says that Kriya Satira started, the Gemara says in the comment that Kriya Satira started with Meisha Rabbeinu. It doesn't say in the Chumash, but Meisha Rabbeinu, the first Hakona that he did on his own, with the Nevim that was then, was that Shabbos, they should read the Torah. And then they added not only Shabbos, but also Monday and Thursday. Why should they read Shabbos and Monday and Thursday? Says the Gemara, because he didn't want three days should go where they have to work in the fields and everything, and they wouldn't even have the chance to hear, to learn some Torah. So at least the minimum is that at least three days shouldn't pass without learning. So they should read the Torah Monday and Thursday and Shabbos. The, the fact that everyone should learn for himself, the Shnei became much later. But the original Takona of reading in the Torah on Shabbos and Monday and, and Thursday is a Takona of Major Abedo. And finalized it, the Gemara says, was Ezra. Ezra was the one that came with the Eden to build up the second Islamic And he was a Takona that Shabbos, they should have seven alias. Monday and Tuesday, and Thursday, they should have three alias. This whole process ended in Ezra. So it started with Meshach Abedo and Ezra with Ezra. Is there any hint in the entire Yes. Um, what? Is there no. any hint in the entire about reading the Torah or the Shnei No. It's with Rabbonu, but it's a Torah of Meshach Why? Why is it? Um, what you mean? Meshach Yes. Um, but, um, by, like, what do the kids do, like, on their 11? Like, do they, they didn't go to school? They, they had, each one had a, a, a malamed. But we are speaking about Haider then. It wasn't like they, have classes. They, they had classes in each the village. They would have classes for little children. But here they call the cheder what you call the yeshiva. Is this called the cheder or yeshiva? You are a mitzvah. Type. You call it yeshiva. Don't, then, when the Rebbe Rashab made a dormitory in Lubavitch for children from 11 till 13, he called it cheder. Why is it only by 11 and 13? Why is it now? Because before 11, no one, no one is going to send from a village of two days away to send them. Those children that became 11 and they came to learn in Lubavitch, they didn't see their parents only once a year. They left for a dormitory. In today's days, even if you go to learn in South Africa, you still come from time to time to see your parents. Then if you went to learn in yeshiva at the age of 11, you don't see your father and mother anymore, only once a year. Obviously, before 11, you can't do that. So till 11, they learn in the city, with Melandim, in the house or in the shul. But at 11, in those years, if you are already ready for the Sirius Nefesh, then you go till Lubavitch. And they called it Chadorim, because it is still 11, Till Bar Mitzvah, they still call it Chador and Rabbi Shem. Um, and why only but until until 14? Do they do until Chayyim and then they go to like they learn? Because really, to start learning the more good, 
you need a mashpia to sit with you and to teach you the Gemore and the Chsides. And in, in Lubavitch, he felt is not the proper, it's too much like New York City. And if you really want to concentrate, it's better when you are in a different place. And it's also easier because if you have thousands of Talmudim in Lubavitch, it's too hard. So they wanted to divide it. So they felt the best thing to divide it is that from Bar Mitzvah till 16, they should go to Mechina in a special place with the Mashpia, with the Rosh Hashiva, and then they'll get the proper attention. And, and like if you said he got married by 15, then, then he didn't learn. So he continued learning after Ishiva. If after he got married, he didn't go to work after he got married on 15. They, as you see the Rebbe Rashad, he continued learning till he became 33 when he became Rebbe. So he continued still learning also, for 18 years. Did he also still learning when he became Rebbe? Sure he did, but he said my morim and he wrote Shuras, but he learned not as a student. He already taught to others. There he just sat the whole day and learned. Was he like a teacher? I just explained before that he would say Shabbos and Magnet, and then the Talmud would come in and he would want to hear how they explained to summarize what he said and if they made a mistake he corrected them and then he told them so you have any questions and they asked questions and what he didn't understand and he would explain them. If he made mistakes, he, when he was a rabbi, we assume that everything that he says is holy. And plus also, between Nadal and Nadal, it was three years, it wasn't really it was the Asian, as I mentioned. People we used to come there and see it and just not as a pseudo vacation. Yes, why did he go on top of Because he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't ready to, he wasn't able as a rabbi to become himself the director and the principal, he couldn't. He needed someone that he could rely on that could run it. Till his, uh, and, his, and his son was still a father, learned for himself. So he wasn't ready for that. After his son got married, and he was 17, that's when he took the obligation on himself and then the, that's when the rabbi. So who took it? Um, so like who took it over? Like, he, who, the rabbi. Um, well, uh, the rabbi Rashab um, took um, was principal of um, the field. The rabbi Rashab was the director and the, the advisor, but the 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 field okay. rabbi after 17 years. He became 37 for 20 years. He was the director of the yeshiva and he was running all the activities. Yes. What started embarrassing that you were a double cover on your next drive over? Tell again. What's the reason you were a double cover on your whenever you dabble in your phone? It says that uh, whenever you dabble, it says he coin. You have to have a special preparation in you for your dabble. And the Shohanoruch, if you take a Shohanoruch from Simen Tzadik till Simen Tzadik K, hey, every day, every Simen is to tell you one thing that you have to prepare yourself when you go to Dhamma. You have to stand proper, think proper, and one of the things is to get dressed proper. What is to get dressed proper? To add on what you usually walk with. There is nothing wrong if you go with a shirt and with the yarn. But when you done, you should add on your shirt something and add on your yarmulke something. After you get married, then in addition to that, you also have a garment for he called extra preparations. So it doesn't really make a difference to why do we wear hats and big hats? The reason why Streimel and Hetz is up to the Xeres that was in Russia for Xeres Olavushim and the Xeres that was in other places in the custom that was there and it's, it's a whole complicated subject to discuss not on one hand but it, it, there actually it became the custom that there after wedding you, you wear a time and here 
only the Rabbeim of Chabad used to wear a triangle on Shabbos, and the uh, Hasidim used to wear not even a hat. He used to wear a casket in Russia. He wasn't allowed to wear a hat in Russia. If they would meet, they would see you with a hat, they would arrest you. There was a different things. They didn't permit you go with Jewish clothes. You had to go dressed just like a regular person, not something special clothes for Jews. So that caused all complications why there's different customs in the clothes. Yes, what's your name? Yes. Why didn't the Rebbe wear them? Because the Rebbe himself, he didn't want to be separated from the city in everything, not only a time. He just wore like everyone, and he did like everyone. They once gave him a special silver pitcher for the wine that he would drink on the, on the... He says, he explained in the letter, I don't want, I should have a different pitcher than all Chesidim they just take from a regular bottle. I also want. They once gave him a silver asterisk holder. Everyone has it, but not everyone. So he didn't want to use it. He didn't want to use silver, just like a regular person. His whole uh, behavior always was just to be just like a regular person. If he goes between other people, if they don't move away, you would recognize that he's something special, not like the others in him. That was the reason that he didn't want to be different. Why didn't he wear a shtime on Why didn't he want to be like a I don't know, because a rabbi has to be a rabbi. And if he's a regular person, you don't just, like a question, if, 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 if the teacher of the class would just be like, like a regular boy and nobody would have to report to anybody, nobody would have the rule over you, it, it, you need some power. But his character was always, that's why also before he became rabbi, he was so hiding everything that he himself was, nobody should know. He did want, he never felt comfortable to be outstanding. He couldn't stand it. So it actually became, after he became rabbi, he also didn't want to become outstanding. So he did only with the most, what he was forced. Did the Rebbe ever wear like a 